again, open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. Begin reading in verse 3 tonight of Ezekiel 2. And read down to verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 2, let's go ahead and look at verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. For they are, a, are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. Let's pray. Father, I do pray tonight that you'd bless the message. And I need a fresh filling of thy spirit. And I pray that you'd give us all ears to hear as we hear the word of God tonight. And I pray, Lord, for your leadership as we begin into this new series that I believe and trust that you've led me to preach. And Lord, uh, you know that I don't know exactly where this is going as far as the series, but I uh, trust you're leading every step of the way. So please uh, bless this first step and again, uh, work in our hearts. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight what I'd like to do is uh, preach an introductory, pretty simplistic message on a new series that I would like to, Lord willing, to preach on Wednesday nights. Now, I'm not preaching this to try to stir anything up. I'm not preaching this to uh, try to be controversial or anything like that. But it's a series that I'm going to entitle, I have entitled, Notice Truths We Rarely Hear From Pulpits Anymore. Truths We Rarely Hear From Pulpits Anymore. You know, there were, are certain Bible truths that were once often preached, but today you very rarely hear preachers mention them anymore. Why? Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why not. First of all, the Bible hasn't changed. The truth is still the truth. Amen? Amen. What God said, right? To say Jesus Christ the same to yesterday, today, and forever. Thy word is truth. It's not because they're not true anymore either. Now I believe that one of the reasons is that we have sunk to such a low level in Bible-believing Christianity that most Christians have declared certain areas of their lives to be off-limits. God can't touch them. Don't mention them. They're taboo. They are forbidden. That would require too much change. Uh, that would be, cause me to look too different than the world. Therefore, we don't want to hear them anymore. You know, it sounds like the last days of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Well, the Bible told, told, tells us to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. And for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. May I say the time has come. People do not want to endure sound doctrine anymore today. And preachers, for a multitude of reasons, we could list them, that's a whole sermon in and of itself, have stopped preaching about them. Now, may I remind us tonight that the Bible addresses every single area of life. Every single area. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Uh, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. 
So it is either by direct command or by Bible principle or by example that God gives us everything you and I need uh, to be complete, to be perfect, to be mature, God-honoring believers. It's all found in the Bible. There's not an area it does not address in one of those forms. Now that means this, that for every area of life, no matter what we're thinking about, no matter what decision we're going to make, uh, no matter what area, there is a Bible answer, there is a Bible standard, and there is a God-honoring way to live in that area if we obey what he says. If we obey. Now, here in Ezekiel chapter 2, we read of this prophet Ezekiel. He is given his assignment here early on in the book. It says, God given assignment as a preacher. Now, Ezekiel, we know, was a prophet of God. He preached for 22 years. He preached to the Jews that were taken away captive into Babylon. He himself was carried away with them in 598 B.C., which was the uh, second stage of the captivity, the first stage. Uh, Daniel went and many of the leaders. The second stage in 598 was Ezekiel and others. And here we see his call and what God wants him to do. Now notice verse 3, what we read. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. God sent him to the children of Israel who were a rebellious people. A rebellious nation. God calls them, if you'll notice in verse 4, for they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. Now Ezekiel is told by God in verse 4 to say to them at the end of the verse, Thus saith the Lord. In other words, preach my word. Notice what we read in verse 7. He was to deliver them the Bible. Notice, and thou shalt speak my words. And then in verse 5 we read something interesting. And they, notice this phrase, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. In other words, uh, they may hear or they may not. That's not the point. At least they're going to know something. That there was a prophet, a prophet of God among them. And they had no excuse to say, well, we didn't know. But it's interesting because God then in verse 6 tells Ezekiel something. Now he's turning to him. And he's saying, look, I want you to tell you something. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of their words because people are going to say things. Don't be afraid of their looks. You mean people give looks when people preach? You ask any preacher that's been in the pulpit. It's amazing what you see sometimes. But don't be afraid, God says, of the hardness of their hearts. Just give them the word of God. Then in verse 8, notice we read, But thou, son of man, now he's going to warn Ezekiel something very important. He says, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. He says, Don't be like the children of Israel. Don't rebel against my command to tell you to preach. You'd be as bad as them then. You need to preach. Open your mouth. You know, the New Testament preacher is commanded to do the very same thing. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, he said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All of it. When the Apostle Paul went to the city of Ephesus and spent over three years there, uh, he tells us, uh, the Bible tells us, he did not shun to declare the whole council. In other words, there was a, not a doctrine he didn't cover. He covered everything. Every doctrine, every area of life uh, he addressed, uh, he held nothing back. He gave them all of it. And that's exactly what you and I need. Not just what pleases our ears. Not just what is palatable or politically correct. Or what other churches are preaching or not preaching. We need the whole counsel of God. We need to know what the Bible says in every area of life. But the big question is this. And that's the title tonight. If we heard it, would we obey it? 
Would you? Are you here tonight willing to say as a believer, God, I'll, I'll do whatever. If I see it in the Bible and it's there, I will obey. And so tonight I'd like to preach on the subject, are we willing to obey? Now before I get into the meat of the message, I have to remind us this. No one gets to heaven by obeying God. Nobody gets to heaven because of some standard that they keep or some way of life that they live. Uh, heaven is simply uh, attained through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. If anyone recognizes their sin condition and their destiny for hell because of it, and that Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead, if they repent of their sin and trust Christ as their Savior, that's how we get to heaven. But as a believer, understand something important. God desires for us to obey him. Well, that's what he wants. You see, if you and I have an area or areas of our lives that, that do not line up in front, with the Bible, and it's clearly proven, would we be willing to change that area of life? And that's the challenge I want to give us tonight. You and I pastored in Oxford. We Wonderful people were there and we, we just enjoyed them and we had a, a fine young Christian man and if I said his name you, some of you may know him but he came to the church with his sister and they moved to the Oxford area from Philadelphia they would attended a Baptist church but it was an inner city Baptist church that was very very liberal and uh, in that church they heard the gospel and uh, he and his sister were both saved but not much more they didn't preach a lot about separation, they didn't preach about standards, they didn't preach about obedience and those sorts of things, but uh, they were so sweet when they came to us, and let me just say this, they were definitely hungry for the truth. They wanted to know what the Bible says. I've had other people come to me and say, all I want is the truth, all I want is tell me, just tell me what the Bible says, and they were the same way. And I remember one time when I was preaching a message and uh, he would sit on the second or third row all the time and diligently take notes as I was preaching. And one time I was preaching a message on separation and just to give kind of a shotgun thing, I, I kind of went down a list of things of what Christians ought not to do. And I said, you know, we're believers here. We shouldn't. And I listed things like attending public movies and uh, going mixed swimming and, and dancing and gambling and playing with playing cards and listening to CCA, all that. I went down and I see him writing very diligently and I went through the message that was just a little portion of it and after the service he came up to me he said could you do me a favor I said what's that he said could you tell me that list again I said really he said he said yes he said could you write that down because he said I want to make sure that I'm not doing those things you see his desire to please God and obey God was not superficial. It wasn't to put on a show. It wasn't so I can leave a, lead a double life, if you will, uh, or really to merely fill a list of do's and don'ts, or to be able to say to others, my list is longer than yours, therefore uh, I, I'm more spiritual than you are. He truly wanted to live a life of obedience to God, and would to God that would be all of our attitudes. But is it? The one thing that God desires for me and you is obedience. Obedience is word. So tonight I'd like us to quickly for a few moments here consider that question. Are we willing to be obedient, to obey? And let's look tonight as the why. Why? Why have standards? Why? Why be obedient? Hey, I'm saved by grace. This is how the liberals talk, right? I'm saved by grace. Uh, shouldn't I be free to, do, to live as I please? Well, that doesn't please the Lord. He wants us to obey Him. Certainly if you're truly saved, that there's nothing, you cannot lose your salvation. We're eternally secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. But that doesn't mean God says, well, go live as you please, and that's okay. Oh, no, not at all. He wants us to live godly in this present world. Holy lives, righteous lives. Now. But why? Why? What are some of the reasons, or perhaps we could say, as I've written on the sheet, some of the results of obedience to God? Why do we do it? Well, let me give you four of them real quick. Number one is this. The first one is this. Obedience empowers 
God's message. It empowers it. Now turn with me to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and I'll read that in a moment. I believe we understand in our church that God has given us an assignment. Amen. We're not here just to try to figure out what to do or just to have men's retreats and ladies' uh, teas and jubilees and all that. It's more than that. Now, we love that. We praise the Lord for that. But that's really not why we're here. He's given us something to do in this world. And we refer to that as the Great Commission. That is our God-given assignment. And we need to stay on track, amen, all the time, saying, is this part of fulfilling the Great Commission? Then we should do it. If it's not, perhaps we shouldn't do it. Well, we've done that all the time. Who cares? If it's not part of trying to fulfill the Great Commission, why should we do it? The Lord said in Matthew 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. What are we to do? We're to go into a lost and dying world. We're to go. We're to give them the soul-saving message of Jesus Christ, the gospel. The gospel defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the death and the burial of, uh, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. I already said it. But if anyone will repent of their sin and trust him as Savior, uh, they have a home in heaven. But let me ask us something. What is it, or perhaps I should say who is it, that empowers that message? What makes that message powerful? Well, well what causes it to, uh, to convict the heart of someone? What causes it to draw the sinner to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you say the Spirit of God does. And I would say, yes, that's true. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, the message is empowered. But may I go a step further and ask this, how are we filled with the Spirit of God? What does it mean? We are filled with the Spirit of God when we are yielded to the Spirit of God. In other words, when we are obedient to His Word. When He has His way in every area of our life. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. When He controls every single part of our life. Now notice what Christ said. He's speaking to His disciples in Matthew chapter 5. We read in verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth. Notice, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a, on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Notice, let your light so shine before men. Why? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. It is our good deeds, it's our good works, it's how we live our life. It's going to empower the message that we give out. And that's so very important. We read in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. That's what we're to be. Lights in a dark world. It is when unbelievers see God's people, those that are saved, truly submitted to God, joyfully obeying His word, that the gospel message is empowered to its fullest. Obedience is so important. I was reading the story of an unbeliever that was visiting a church. She was invited by her co-worker. She said, I'm going to sing at church this week. Would you like to come and hear me sing? She'd been, uh, she heard she was a Christian, and the, the girl singing said she was a Christian, but she was living like the world. And the co-worker had very little respect for her. But she thought, well, I'll just go to hear her sing. And she did. She went that Sunday morning and she sat and the girl got up and she got uh, behind the podium there and she sung Amazing Grace. Well, the service was over and someone asked the co-worker that was there, oh, you're here visiting your co-worker? That was so nice of you to come. And she said, what did you think of the song? The co-worker said this, unfortunately, her life speaks so loud that I could not hear her song. And I wonder if that could be said of us. 
You see, obedience empowers it. Without a life of obedience, without a life that is yielded uh, uh, to the word of God, our message will be hindered. Our message will be ineffective. It'll be, as Paul said, a, a sounding brass and, and tinkling cymbal. You see, the more yielded we are, the more powerful the message will be. That's why this stuff is important we're going to be dealing with. Because we want our message empowered. But then there's a second thing. Notice, obedience to God not only empowers God's message, it also proves our love to God. Now turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5. We like to say, and I, oh, we see bumper stickers, and uh, people sing it, and we say it as well, that we love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. We sing it. And uh, I believe we do. But how much? How much? How much do I truly love him? How does God measure that love to him? <laughs> well, it's simple. He tells us. 1 John 5, 3 tells us how he measures it. Notice, for this is the love of God. Here it is that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Again, it's not just the do, it's the attitude behind it that we're not begrudging it. We're not saying, well, I'll do what he wants me to do, yeah. No, we're to keep it, uh, keep it, and again, uh, uh, and not, they're not grievous to us. Jesus said it himself to his disciples in the upper room in John chapter 14. Very simply put in verse 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. That's amazing. You see, we've fallen for this new age, uh, modern definition of love, and it's just this, oh, fuzzy feeling, and I just love Jesus. That's not the Bible definition. Our love is measured by our obedience. John 15, 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Again, the depth of our love to Christ is measured by our level of obedience to his word. May I say that again? The depth of our love to Christ is measured by the level of our obedience to his word. The more we obey, the more we love him. The less we obey, the less we love him. So I ask us tonight, do we love him enough to let him control and direct and have ownership over every area of our lives? Every corner of our hearts, every possession that we have. You know, we're all pretty much the same in a lot of ways. We have an Adamic nature. And we all have those little areas, be it they're all a little bit different, that we want to say to him, don't touch that one. Now, I like to point out the areas that I let him have that you don't let him have. And you like to do it opposite with other people as well. But let's for a little bit, as we come in the weeks to come, let's look at those areas that you and I have said, oh no, uh, I'm not so sure about that one. You say, how much does he want? He wants it all. And we see that in Genesis 22. Let's go there quickly and look at that verse. We won't go to the whole story. But uh, that's the story of Abraham and Isaac. That's what it's all about. I mean, to think of, uh, and I mentioned this in a sermon a couple weeks ago, uh, to think of God asking a, a man who had a son, one son, to take that son and march up to the mountain and sacrifice him. And to see them going up, and that whole story is very touching. But we know the story that he did. He obeyed God and uh, he brought him up to that mountain and he placed him uh, uh, there on that uh, place of uh, uh, sacrifice and he lifted up that, uh, that uh, knife and uh, the moment he did that, uh, he was interrupted. Abraham, why stop? Don't do it. And then he says in verse 12, and he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Notice what he says, for now... I know that thou fearest God. 
Wait a minute, he said it many times before. I fear you, God. I love you. I want to obey you. But it was only when he did that, it proved his love to God. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. You see, God's goal in your life and in my life, uh, don't ever forget, it's not the size of the work that he's interested in. It's the sort of the work that he's interested in. He can do a lot more with less people that are dedicated and sold out to God than with a whole bunch of people uh, that are living like the devil throughout the week. Think about that. And what he wants from me and you is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 where we read casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Christ. Here it is. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He wants it all. He desires every thought of yours and mine to be brought unto the obedience of Christ. You see, if there's an area that you and I have that we refuse to submit, if we have labeled off limits, then our love for him is not as deep as it could be. It could be much more. So obedience to God, number one, empowers God's message. Number two, it proves our love to God. And then thirdly and quickly, it also procures God's blessings and favor. Turn with me to... Deuteronomy chapter 28. And we read some verses here, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, although we could, and I encourage you to. In Deuteronomy 28, as this second generation is about ready to enter into the promised land, God is trying to show them something. He's trying to teach them that a simple truth, if you simply obey me, I am going to bless you beyond measure. Uh, I'll give you things. I'll bless your home. Uh, I'll bless your family. I'll, I'll bless your crops. Uh, I'll bless your production. All of that. But then he goes to say, if you don't, there's a word that we don't like to use. It may sound very harsh, but it's a Bible word. He'll curse us. Notice Deuteron uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, in verse 1, It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come for I'm sorry, shall come on thee and overtake thee. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, uh, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. I won't read it for time's sake, but over and over, blessed, 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 blessed. But then he shows the other side of the coin in verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. Cursed shall, thy, shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The very flip side of all of that. You see, the formula is really simple. It's not, the Christian life isn't difficult. I mean, it's not, it may be difficult to do, but it's not difficult to understand. It is this. Obey God, he will bless us. Disobey God, he will curse us. Deuteronomy eleven twenty six. a little bit back, won't go there, but I'll read it. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. Now, if you're like me, and I believe you are in this area, I want God to bless us. Do you want God to bless you? Raise your hand. I'll start over if you raise your hand if you didn't get it yet. Yes, amen. I want him to bless us. I want him to bless our church. I want him to bless my life. I want him to bless my marriage. 
I want them to bless my children and my grandchildren. I, I do. I, I want them to bless our church. I want him to answer my prayers. I mean, think about tonight. It could have all been in vain if we're all living in disobedience to him. It could have been just words going up uh, to, to his ceiling and not to heaven. I want my prayers answered. I, I want God to work in the lives of my lost loved ones. I want to see them saved. I have a great burden for them. And you have as well for the ones you love that are lost. But understand that his blessings are directly related to our obedience. It is. Why did God take away King Saul's kingdom? One word. Disobedience. God said to do certain things. He didn't do them. We could name several things he didn't do. Probably a lot of things he didn't do, Saul. But the, perhaps the one thing that tipped the scales, if you will, when he was uh, told to go and, and kill all the Amalekites and destroy them all, utterly take them out, and he did not do it. And he's confronted by the prophet Samuel who comes to him. And do you remember what he said to him in verse uh, 22 of chapter 15? We read, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? In other words, you think God is interested in your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, and he's not interested in obedience? It's not the sacrifice, it's the obedience he wants with the sacrifice out of obedience, but not instead of obedience. Then he goes on to say this, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. So if we want the blessings of God upon our church, understand we need to examine our hearts in every area of our lives and ask ourselves, are they submitted to him? Are we in obedience to him? So obedience to God, number one, empowers God's message. Number two, it proves our love to God. Number three, it procures God's blessing and favor. And then number four, it propels our growth. I've said this many times, I'll say it again. Spiritual growth is not a chronological thing. It is not a chronological thing. Now it's wonderful to be saved for years, but it's not just how long you've been saved. It's how you've grown spiritually. Where are you? I've known people that have been saved for 50, 60 years, don't even have church attendance down yet. They don't have giving down yet. Uh, they, it's, uh, there's not, and they've stopped somewhere. Now go to Hebrews chapter 5 and we'll read a familiar passage here. As Paul was dealing with these Hebrew Christians that had stopped growing. They should have been because of how long they were saved. They should have been teaching others the basic principles of the Bible. They should have had Sunday school classes. They should have been bus captains. I'm putting in today's vernacular. You understand what I mean. They were saved long enough, heard enough things to be able to stand up before people and give out the truth, but they couldn't do it. Why is that? Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11 of whom we have many things to say, speaking of Melchizedek, he was going to go into depth, more depth about who Melchizedek is, but he stopped himself and realized, I can't go any further because these folks, they're not listening. He says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For, when the for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. But for every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What happened to them? Here's what happened. Here's what they did. Now, they may not have done that physically, but they did that spiritually. They stopped listening to God. Can you imagine if everyone had stopped listening to God would do this in a service? <laughs> Be able to spot them pretty easily, huh? But they felt like they had gone far enough in their Christian life. Uh, they felt like they, uh, uh, they, were, they were not going to go any further. That was it. You see, when we stop obeying, understand what happens. We stop growing spiritually. 
And when we stop growing spiritually, what happens is we don't remain there. We start regressing spiritually. You see, the Christian life is always moving. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. If you think you're standing still, that means you're probably moving backwards. Because again, when we stop obeying, we stop growing. When we stop growing, we start re regressing. And so what I'm trying to challenge us today, tonight, as we head forth into this series, because we're going to hear some things, I'm sure, you're going to say, amen to, brother, that's for so-and-so. But then the very next week, instead of saying amen, you're going to say, oh my. Because it rings your bell. And you're going to be confronted with, am I doing this? By the way, the preacher is going to be confronted as well. Because I'm as responsible as you are. So let me ask you something tonight. How far are you willing to go for God? Are you willing to say all the way? No holds barred. God, if it's in the Bible and I see it and I'm not doing it by God's grace and with your help, I'm going to change whatever needs to be changed. How are you going to respond when you get challenged in areas that many preachers aren't preaching about anymore? That many churches are ignoring? How will you respond? You say, preacher, what are you going to preach on? I don't know. We'll see. But think about it. When was the last time you heard preaching on things like I mentioned earlier, perhaps things like dress, alcohol, gambling, music, gluttony, public mixed swimming. How about when we're challenged with Bible truths like fasting, using minced words, witchcraft, sorcery, Maybe separation issues like long hair on men and short hair on women. Is it in the Bible? It is. It is. Do we have principles? We do. But preacher, don't say anything about those things. Because people might get mad. I'm not trying to get people mad. As I said before, I want us to be under submission to him in all areas of our lives. And if it means talking about things that we've already boxed out, then so be it. Because I have areas I've boxed out in my life too, as I've even read some of that list that I need to fix. The question is, are we willing to? You see, there's a big difference between being ignorant of Bible truth and refusing Bible truth. All of us begin ignorant of Bible truth. We get saved. We learn about salvation. But you know, we don't know hardly anything about anything. And we're just happy to be saved. But you know, God doesn't want to leave us there. He is the disturbing Christ who wants to disturb our lives and make us what he wants us to be. That means, little by little, he starts confronting us with different things and draws a line in the sand and says, what are you going to do? obey. You see, once we learn that truth, now it's not a matter of ignorance. It's a matter of rebellion. But thank God, even when we're rebellious, as it was, they were in Ezekiel, it, God still sent Ezekiel and gave them an opportunity to get things straight. So maybe this series will help us get some things straight that you and I for years have been saying, or maybe months, or who knows how long, don't touch that area, Lord. Would you be willing tonight to say, Lord, if I see it in your word, by God's grace, I'll obey. If so, maybe you want to come to the altar and tell God that. Lord, whatever you say, if I see it, I'll do it.